Yeah, so I will try to do it in 12 minutes. So that forces me uh, to read because otherwise I will be expanding too much. So I hope you can follow me. Um, I believe we are just at the beginning of a new renaissance, a new modernity of which we are far from sure what it brings or could enlighten, if at all. As Yuri Solop outlined once, the way we personally communicate, use, and to some extent even alter digital reality, it is mostly in the form of the visual image. End quote. In fact, architecture has always played an essential role in this throughout history. While our body moves through space, feet touch the ground, hands opening doors, it is what's projected, or what Deleuze has called, the brain is the screen. All comes into the brain and is there processed. And that has truly impact. That what is processed unconsciously by our mind through the eye, foremost in distraction, as Benjamin observed. Also, many architects have acknowledged and demonstrated the importance of the imagination, architecture's materialization of our senses, the power to create images or imaginations for that matter. And that is indeed a good partial definition of what architecture competence is. I will argue that the architectural in imagination and that very much includes the image and its visual, digital culture it brings with it today, is precisely and can be a staging ground for action. So the question is, I think, if in our era of media becoming digital and the migration of ideas, people and subjectivity, if architecture can still ignite individual and collective imaginations otherwise not through language, but precisely through its visual impact, or what you can call, we need to create ethical spectacles. Or in other words, I believe we have to think with images again, and also the, the, the images we just have seen are an indication to that. Because images govern our dreams, desire, or drive our actions, can create alternative stories and meanings beyond what neoliberalism makes us believe and dream. Instead of disqualifying images altogether in our age of total over-visibility, what a lot of what you could call lazy critique sees as the only option, I hope to make clear that we need to embrace the image in opposition to the visual, and I will explain that. So we need to start to see again, beyond language, no longer rest aside in or with text or just in words, like in academia, but have to become popular again, be able to connect to the world, create against or create imaginations against the reactionary populism of Trump and many others. Two points will help me in this short talk to imagine anew, to create ethical spectacles. One, we live a rather bizarre moment in our time, which I and myself have called the new normal. Secondly, we need to address what kind of normative claims, eth ethical uh, aspects can be enforced in this arising new normal, and how we can do that through digital technology and the digitized cultures of visuals. So let's begin, or continue. Recently, Douglas Copland flew over a Cayune swamp in pursuit of purple lights in the distance. When he removed his virtual reality headset, he looked at his favorite room in the world, filled with good friends on a beautiful summer evening on the terrace and thought, man, what a dump, reality is toast. Copland's example the recent selfie architecture of people climbing the highest skyscrapers taking a selfie, Elon Musk shooting his roadstar to Mars, Me Too movements, Bitcoin millionaires, Donald Trump's alternative facts, Edward Snowden and his A leaks, or the many drone perspectives and the illegal USA killing, making many victims, Las Vegas, etc., etc. Uh, art becoming vir virtual 
questioning robotization, etc. It are just one out of many bizarre and shocking moments that a new normal is on the horizon. We no longer are living a time of one satellite in the air, Sputnik, or a TV standing besides our bed or table. The impact of the virtual and its image has become total. And I see already running out of time. So when something new appears, we may understand it as a combination of familiar things at first. A car is a horseless carriage. A handheld computer, camera plus wireless data, is a mobile phone. A metropolis woven with sensors, networks, information technology is a smart city. A blockchain is digital money, and so on. But this new normal of interlacing things, as we just have seen, is not a hybrid, it's a new normal. And once the gap between what our hybrid concepts try to explain and what is happening becoming so widely normal, we need to move on and to think about new concepts. And that brings me to the next aspect. And that is, in fact, and I go a bit faster, here we see all kinds of examples of the new normal. And I also quit that. And that is, in fact, uh, a film uh, Jean-Luc Godard made, and he called that a goodbye to language. And uh, what he said is that uh, 3D technology is still an area where there are no rules. There are plenty of rules once you have invented them, and I am then less interested because there are only rules. It has to be done this way or that. Whereas when new techniques are invented, it's like a new beginning. It's like being a child. There are no rules. So Godard uses the new technology to build up a multi-layered, richly textured image poem of sometimes breathtakingly simplicity and beauty. So he pushes 3D technology beyond the boundaries to create visually disorientating experiences, a plausible other world. To my mind, the film theorist Sergi Denet can help us to understand what the difference is between an image and a visual. And let's shortly read what he says. The visual keeps us from seeing because it prefers that we decode that we decipher, that we read. The news shows us the facts. We understand what we see through the visual. A person is shot. Instead, the image always challenges us to carry out a montage with others, with some other. Because in the image, as in democracy, there is a free play, unfinished pieces, gaps, openings. The idea of democracy or the democratic image of Denet should be understood in opposition to what Flusser has called the technical image, the universe of technical images, such as photographs, films, video, television screens, and computer terminals, taking over the formerly served linearity of text. And this cultural revolution of the technical image has now become interactive with the arrival of the web, etc., etc. When images supplanted text, says William Flusser, we experience, perceive and value the world and ourselves differently. No longer in one-dimensional linear processes, but spatially and in 3D <coughs> manners. Um, what I believe, although William Flusser is very right about the technical image, I prefer to call that the technical visual following Serge Denet, and that we should be after the image, images which are open, which deepen and extend a sense of democracy, or in other words, what kind of ethical spectacles could be produced in opposition to the spectacularization like we see in Dubai, or we can see in the resorts in the Netherlands, etc. And that brings me to some old work, and also in the language of vision by George Capps, he discusses Picasso's Guernica, because there is a tradition of images which are the opposite of what the visuals are. 
but it's still beyond language. It works on the visual level. So, uh, Kepps discusses Picasso's Guernica, and according to him, Guernica evokes an optical furry and the shrieks of danger siren. Guernica itself, of course, was a reference to the fascist bombing of civilians in the Spanish Civil War. It is an imagination, an imaginative projection of the discrepancy, discrepancy between life as it is and life as it should be, representing human figures in a distortion of pain and suffering. Tears are in action like a bursting bomb. The plastic interconnections of the lines, planes, and texture surfaces act as do suffering individuals. Two contradictionary systems, plastic organization, the message of order and the organization of meaningful whole. The message of chaos are wielded in an indivisible whole. This image works in a manner different from advertising, or in fact a lot of architects today trying to make sculptures. A lot of art is going much further in what that new formations, what way of meaning they produce. So there is a disjunction in this image, in this painting, of what has happened, life as it is, and what should happen, life as it should be. Kepis is after images of temporal disjunction. It is not about engineering, more playful or creative, but to challenge our imagination of life and technology. And it also reminds me of another writer, a French philosopher, François Julien, and there is a fantastic book, I think, and that is called The Great Image Has No Form. And he refers, for instance, to Chinese traditional painting where, uh, to make a long story short, uh, in the tradition of Chinese painting, it's not that you represent or illustrate or try to mimic the real, but what you try to paint is like walking, how it feels, how you see it when you walk through the mountains in the rain. So it addresses the senses, it addresses, it's an aesthetic which addresses the senses and ideas of perception in trying to capture what the, re the reality is about in a painting. So the great image has no form. So seeing with Godard, looking for a democratic image, a great image with no form, I agree that, or I agree with Godard, that we live in a time and need to say goodbye to language. Text and words are still there, are still important, but they more and more lose their dominant role, play another lesser role. It is the imagination that counts, which comes through all those visual stimuli. And what we need are, is to create images, staging grounds for action beyond the universe of the visual. And now I hope you understand, uh, I hope what images can be about, what to think of the current new normality, we are confronted with in such imaginary escapes as we have encountered in Blade Runner 249. Let's have a look at this hologram love scene. And you see it already. Speaking to Vulture, director Villeneuve spoke at length about what went into making the scene from a technical standpoint, as well as how he wanted to develop Kay's character. As a result of the experience, in an effort to give the lonely K a chance to actually experience making love to a woman with a real body, Joy employs Mariette to represent her physical form as she superimposes herself, sometimes clumsily, over her. The result is a surreal yet strangely erotic scene. Villeneuve explained that the unsynchronized movement of both actresses during the scene was a deliberate choice. The way eyes move or a hand, I felt the smaller gesture, the more erotic and powerful the scene would be. I love the idea that you were feeling both presences of both women at the same time, and that sometimes it was like you were feeling a third woman. The slight imperfections, in fact, in the resulting scene was Villeneuve's way of making it feel less magical and making viewers feel the limit of technology. 
although the imagination becomes in Blade Runner, I think, very close to what awaits us in the future, I question the direction its disjunctive imaginary effect has, for instance, if you compare it to the work of Picasso or Jean-Luc Godard. The action route of the imagination of Blade Runner's holochrom love scene, let's say for the moment that it's an image, not a technical image, what does it actually normalize? What is its normalizing claim? I believe it is caught in a typical Hollywood perspective, one of identity politics. Let's look what Nancy Fraser, the political scientist, said about that. And I come to my conclusion. Recently, Nancy Fraser introduced the oxymoron progressive neoliberalism, neo or in fact what I called in the 90s uh, when talking about Dutch architecture, fresh conservatism. This progressive neoliberalism is an alliance of mainstream currents of new social movements, feminism, anti-racism, multiculturalism on the one side, and high-end symbolic and service-based business sectors, Wall Street, Silicon Valley, and Hollywood on the other. In this alliance, progressive forces are effectively joined with the forces of cognitive capitalism. We should not forget that these forms, free of any no nostalgia, as in classical conservatism, are neoliberal forces prepared to accommodate the new of uncontrolled social forces, only in order to channel them into constantly reinvented forms of private wealth and family inheritance. I believe we need to imagine the possibility of something else based on the new idea of the common and the individual, based on the new normal arising and confront the many forms of struggle in concrete situations today. There are paradoxical communities emerging all over, and we always have to relate to others and also our, as ourselves we become other. So now that we all belong to paradoxical communities, the new normal, we have in fact become cosmopolitan, a citizen of the world. But we have to be very careful and make a distinction between globalization and cosmopolitization. In contrast, cosmopolitization should be considered to be multidimensional, while globalization is primarily uh, one-dimensional economical growth. So this cosmopolitical outlook I'm after, if we really observe her, has its home in amazement, one of new technologies and the vir one of new technologies and the virtual can bring, in the expanding in between, in which seemingly eternal certainties, borders and differentiations become blurred and effaced. Here we find transcending identities, something we might think in terms of multiplicities. Every individual has to orientate oneself to find oneself among one's multiple personalities with the help of others. We need to ask ourselves the question, can difference and sharing, conflict and the general interests be thought together? And that means we have to extend and expand the idea of what democracy could be, or in other words, that we have to strive for a cosmo political approach in architecture, which is cares about the cosmos of nature and works on a new sense of the political. Thank you very much.